In the last part of macroeconomics, we'll be talking about money, the money supply, and then the Federal Reserve and monetary policy. So um, to start with, we want, just want to consider what is money, what makes something acceptable as money, and what are the functions of money. Um, and money is basically um, a medium of exchange. It's something that we can use to trade for goods and services. Um, it's something that firms can use to trade for our labor, for the use of other resources. If you look at this slide, it basically talks about the characteristics that make something work as money. So for example, um, in order to work as money, an item has to be portable. That means you have to be able to actually carry it around. Um, it has to be uniform, meaning each, each piece of it looks the same. So gold worked pretty well because they could make gold into coins that were the same size and weight. Um, if you had different pieces or sizes of gold, they wouldn't work as well. It has to be divisible. In other words, you want to be able to make change. You wouldn't want something um, like a valuable diamond because it might be worth $10,000, but it doesn't work very well as money because you might want to buy something that only costs $1,000 and then you wouldn't be able to get change for it. It has to be durable, meaning it will last. So most types of food don't work very well as money because they will rot. And then it has to be acceptable or stable in value. So it has to be something that if you hold on to it, you know it will be worth money. It will actually have value later. Okay, so how will each of these items work? You can probably imagine uh, salt worked actually very well because salt is very portable, uniform, easily divided, uh, very durable, and it had a lot of value in the ancient world. Cattle were used as a form of money, but of course they don't work quite as well. Um, they're fairly portable because they can walk for themselves, um, but they're not uniform, they're certainly not divisible, um, and their lives are limited and the value is definitely fluctuating. So you can look at each one of these and kind of see what works, what doesn't. Um, salt, beaver pelts, and shells and dollar bills, of course, have all been used as money. Um, cigarettes actually have been used as money in prison because in prison they are very rare um, because they're illegal and they're valued. Therefore, uh, the scarcity gives them pretty regular value. All right, so the functions of money, uh, as I said, money is basically a medium of exchange, and that is, I would say, the predominant function of money is that it works in trade, that you can trade money for one item, uh, and the person who receives the money can use it to buy something else. So medium of exchange is the, the primary purpose. However, the other two are also important, and I'm gonna skip to the third one, store of value. First, store of value means that whatever you have as money will actually keep its value. So, um, you, couldn't, you can just print up money, paper money, and, and give it to people and use it for exchange, but because people know, oh, it's really easy to just keep printing more and more money, um, then it doesn't really have a stable store of value. Uh, it's important that people be able to save money as well as spend it, and it's important that money endure over multiple transactions. So uh, a store of value is also an important piece of money. The third is unit of account, and that means that money gives us a language to use to talk about the relative prices of things. So if you walk into a shoe store and you see a pair of shoes for $25, you know that's, hey, that's relatively cheap. If you walk in and you see a pair of shoes and it's $2,500, you think, my goodness, those are expensive shoes. I don't think I can afford them. But without some kind of unit of account that makes sense to us, it wouldn't be very helpful. Uh, you really notice this particular feature if you travel in a different country and suddenly, for example, I was buying things with uh, Hungarian currency, you know, something costs 650 zlotys and it's like, I, I don't know what those are worth. So I would always have to translate back to the US dollar unit of account. So the unit of account really helps us look at relative prices and, and decide what we should demand, right, and what we should supply and what's not worth it to us. Um, what gives our money value? Many people get confused about this because many, many people think that the U.S. dollar is backed by gold, but in fact it is not. It certainly was for a period of time in our history, but it hasn't been for over 80 years. So um, some money is, has inherent value, meaning it has something like commodity value. So salt, for example, in the ancient world had a commodity value. People wanted salt for a different use, um, so salt was valuable to them, and so it worked as money because it had value. When we were on the gold standard, our money had what we call representative value, meaning you could trade a U.S. dollar in for a certain amount of gold, and so the dollar actually represented a commodity value. But that is not true of our money right now. Our paper dollars have really no inherent value, and the only thing you can trade them in for 
is more paper dollars. So our currency has what we call fiat value, which means it has value because we declare that it has value. On each US dollar or reserve note, it says this, dope, this note is up here. This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. And that means uh, the government has said this money has to be accepted for transactions in the United States, and therefore it has to be accepted. You would be breaking the law if you refuse to accept payment in dollars. All right, so we know what money is. How do we actually measure money or track money? This gets a little bit complicated because our money supply isn't just dollars and coins. It's actually much broader than that. The Federal Reserve is responsible for tracking and measuring the money supply, um, and banks, savings and loans, and credit unions, so all types of financial institutions, report the value of their deposits to the Fed. So it is broken down into checkable deposits, well, the money that's in checking accounts, which is also called demand deposits. You want to be able to use those two terms interchangeably, checkable deposits or demand deposits. They also report what's in savings accounts, okay, and they report what's in what's called time accounts. So like a certificate of deposit where you might put money in a one-year CD, that would be a time account. And the Fed then draws arbitrary lines between the kinds of assets, okay, and a checking account, a savings account, a time account, those would all be assets that serve primarily as a medium of exchange and the ones that serve primarily as a store of value. So these are the definitions of money. M1 is the narrowest definition of money uh, and the narrowest definition of the money supply. And most of the time, when we refer to the money supply, like when we're talking about uh, the money market, we are referring to M1. M1 includes primarily two things. Currency and coin, which I'm going to put together, that's cash and change, okay, and our demand deposits or our checking accounts. So those are the, the, the two big parts. That's like 95% of M1 right there, maybe 99%, is what's in checking accounts and what people have in cash and in coins. This is called M1 because it is, sorry for the interruption, we'll knock at the door there. Um, okay, so what I was saying was that um, M1 is currency and coin and demand deposits. Um, it is the money that is in what we call liquid form, and you want to know that term. Liquidity means how spendable is the cash, okay? So if it's in, in liquid form, that means you can spend it right now. If you have a check in your pocket or you have a quarter in your pocket, you can spend that money right now. Um, the third one that gets counted there is something called traveler's checks. Um, and traveler's checks make up about 1% of M1, and they are something that you can actually buy. It's sort of like a, a private currency that you buy from a company like American Express and you can use them really anywhere, but, but they're primarily used overseas. And the, the key to traveler's checks is that they have a serial number on them, and you record them, and if they are lost, you can actually get them replaced. But they're not a real significant part of M1. They are immediately spendable, however. Um, M2 is the broader measure of the money supply or money stock. Um, it includes all of M1. So if you envision this is M1, okay, M2, encompasses M1, but adds a few more things. So it actually also includes savings accounts and small time deposits, okay? It includes money market deposit accounts and other money market funds. It is less liquid. So something, money that's in your savings account, you theoretically cannot spend it right now. And I realize that debit cards have sort of blurred the line between these two. But for the purpose of our definitions, if money is in a savings account, it's not in spendable form. If it's in a checking account, it is in spendable form. Um, so M1 is money that is primarily being used as a medium of exchange, where M2 includes money that is primarily being held as a store of value. And I haven't updated these numbers recently, but you can see that M2 at 8.5 trillion in 2010 is significantly larger than M1. So the money that people have is much greater than the money that people have in spendable or ready to spend form. All right, there used to be something called M3, which was also quite large, larger than M2. Um, it also included large time deposits, which would be money that was set aside and really nobody expected to use or spend it anytime soon. Um, and that money is basically in the hands of large businesses and financial institutions, but it was hard to count, and so we stopped counting it in 2006. Some critics say that raised the risk of inflation, but given where we're at on inflation almost 10 years later, meaning there's no inflation, probably not a big issue. Um, this is the monetary base, which is basically the potential money or the money that exists in banks that could be turned into um, cash and currency. 
and you can see it has expanded rather dramatically uh, since the last recession. Um, but again, we still have not experienced inflation. All right, what is not money? It's very important to know that certain things that people use that they spend or they trade are actually not money. Um, any kind of asset that does not fit the medium of exchange is not money. So gold, houses, jewelry, and collectibles are not money, even though they are assets. Credit cards are also not money, and that's kind of a confusing one. Um, the book says that credit cards are not money because they are loans, but loans actually are money. So I don't really like that definition. I'm just going to say that credit cards are not money because they are uncountable. Okay, credit cards don't represent a fixed amount of money. Um, they represent access, immediate access to a loan. So um, until you actually pay the fee or pay, pay the credit card bill, there's not really money being exchanging hands. Okay, this is the last thing that I want to get to today, just to introduce you to the concept of the money market. And um, the money market is where nominal interest rates are set. So nominal interest rates are set by market forces. Nominal interest rates are the rates that you pay to borrow money from a bank. Say you want to buy a car, you want to buy a house. Uh, nominal interest rates also represent the amount that uh, banks pay you. So if you have money in an account. Um, those two numbers are going to be slightly different. So when you think of nominal interest rates, I want you to think of them more as a family of rates or a group of rates than any one specific rate. The money market, if you look at uh, the graph on the right, is actually the complete money market. And what you can see is that the y-axis here is the interest rate, and it's actually the nominal interest rate. So the advertised interest rate, not, not the interest rate adjusted for inflation. And the x-axis is the amount of money demanded and supplied, or what we'll just call the quantity of money. So the demand for money comes from two things. There is a transactions demand for money, okay, which is how much money do we need in order to be able to buy and sell the things we want to buy and sell. And you can see that that's a vertical line because the transactions demand for money does not depend on the interest rate. The transactions demand for money depends on uh, basically the size of the GDP, how much stuff are we buying and selling. The asset demand for money, however, which is the middle graph, the asset demand for money is inversely related to the interest rate. Because at high interest rates, you can see here 10%, what people are going to do is they're going to put their money in the bank and not, not they're going to put it in a savings account. They're not going to have it in spendable form. But as interest rates go down, and right now interest rates are down in this range, right? So what we see is that people actually demand quite a bit of money. People will keep money on hand. They'll keep cash in their wallet. They'll keep money in their checking account because they have really no reason to put it in a savings account. So as interest rates rise, the quantity of money that's being de uh, demanded, and that would be M1, is actually going to decline. And as interest rates fall, uh, M1, the quantity that people want as M1 is going to rise. So we put those two together. When you add these two lines together, you get this total demand for money line, okay, which is right here. And the money supply is actually uh, represented as a vertical line because the money supply is set by the Fed. And I usually just use M, S, and M, D rather than D subscript, M subscript, or S, S subscript. So the money supply is a vertical line because the Fed sets the money supply. So if you look at this third graph, you can see that the intersection of the money supply with the current demand for money is what determines equilibrium interest rates. So if the money supply is increased, you can see that interest rates will drop. And if the money supply is decreased, you can see that interest rates will increase. So that's a brief introduction for today, and we'll talk a little bit more about, um, about money policy and how the Fed works next week.